Hello, everyone. I'm Tanuja Kopal, Consulting Editor for BioCompare, and welcome to this Bench Tips webinar. Today, we learn more about one of the hottest topics in drug discovery today, and that is uh, protax mediated targeted protein degradation. I think it has attracted attention from academia, pharma, biotech alike, so it's going to be a good discussion. So as many of you may know, the BenchTip webinar series was created to bring together senior graduate students and postdocs to share some of their technical knowledge, which sometimes really gets you know, buried in their lab notebooks or you know, just in a research paper, and it never comes out. So this is really a unique forum to, for them to come and share some of their best practices with us and for you as an attendee to ask questions and possibly even learn from some of the mistakes that they may have made. So the goal is really to keep everything very informal and interactive. So let's begin. Um, each panelist will give short talks and we'll follow that with a Q&A session. Uh, there is a ask a question button, which is at the upper right hand corner of your screen. I really recommend sending in those questions as soon as they come to mind, because if you wait until the end, sometimes, you know, we have so many questions, we may not get to yours. So type away and send it in. Uh, if you're having any problems with the uh, in the connection, we have a test your connection button, which is at the bottom of your screen. So just click on that and you will find the help that you need. Uh, we also have some social media widgets that you can use to share this webinar with your friends or colleagues who you think might benefit from listening to this webinar. On the right hand side of your screen, we have an overview of the webinar. We also have some information about our speakers, their expertise, their experiences. And finally, we have some resources that we have uh, been provided by our sponsors. Um, so I do want to extend a big thank you to our many sponsors, Nanotemper, BPS Bioscience, TA Instruments, and Biotechni for supporting this webinar and for sharing some of those resources with us today. So please take a look and download them. I'm sure they'll be very helpful. So with that, I'm going to actually turn things over to our moderator for this webinar, who is Dr. Catherine Donovan. She's a senior scientist in Dr. Eric Fisher's lab at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. She works on the development of molecular glues and protax, and she has uh, helped set up, optimize, and actually lead a high throughput proteomics pipeline, both in the Fisher lab as well as, a part, as part of the Center for Protein Degradation at Dana-Farber. So uh, Catherine will be providing us with a short overview on the topic, and she will be introducing the speakers for the webinar as well. So welcome, Catherine, and appreciate your help with moderating this webinar. Uh, so thank you, Tanuja, uh, for the very kind introduction. Um, I wanted to start by giving a quick summary of um, the UPS system and kind of what the whole goal is here in degradation. So the UPS system is one of two major systems that eukaryotic cells use to maintain homeostasis. Um, in this system, different signaling events can occur that initiate various cellular processes, such as post-translational modifications or um, unfolding events um, that can initiate various cellular processes um, leading to the recruitment of proteins to the ligase. Um, this recruitment results in ubiquitination of these specific targets and then downstream proteosomal degradation. Um, so over the last several years, uh, we have learned from a lot of different groups um, and experiences that this process not only happens naturally, but also that we're able to use small molecule chemical inducers to hijack this degradation pathway to induce degradation of proteins that we choose to remove. Um, so, for example, a protein that is overexpressed in different cancers could be specifically targeted and downregulated in cells um, using specially designed small molecules. Uh, so there are two types of small molecule degraders that are often described in the literature. The first are molecular glues, um, which do basically, as their name suggests, and act as a glue to bind two proteins together, a GIT and a ubiquitin ligase. This leads to ubiquitination of the target and then downstream degradation. So these types of molecules are usually discovered um, serendipitously and they've been notoriously difficult to design rationally. The second type of small molecule degrader are heterobifunctional degraders. Um, these allow a little bit of control or target selectivity because we can design these dual headed molecules. We have a single head here and a second head here. 
where one end binds to the target of interest and then the other end binds to the E3 ligase. Um, this allows us a bit more control over which targets we're able to degrade so we can target things that we would like to remove. So the question that starts to arise when thinking about these degraders is how do we even start out degrading these or designing these molecules? And then once we've designed them and we've synthesized them, how do we know if they're even working in our cell experiments or our in vitro experiments? So there are many questions that we ask ourselves when we get started um, synthesizing these molecules, such as, is my protein of interest a good target? Or how do I prioritize a specific target? Which binder should I use? Um, do I need high affinity or high selectivity? Is there a linker link that works best? Um, and what about linker chemistry? Is that important? Does it really matter? And which E3 ligase should I try first? Should I try all of them? Or is there one that I should start with? So once we develop this library and we synthesize our molecules, there are many more questions about um, how to experimentally test these molecules. So we want to determine, you know, are they effective at degrading our target of interest, um, as well as other perhaps unanticipated targets. So at this point, we start to think about the steps that are required for effective degradation of um, the proteins of interest. Uh, so one question that arises is, which cell line do I use? Um, is this important? Does it really matter which cell line I use for my experiments? How do I know if my molecule is getting into cells? I know my molecule needs to engage the target as well as the ligase, but how do I test this? Should this be tested in vitro or in cells? And how do I know what this complex actually looks like? Um, I know ternary complex is important for ubiquitin transfer, but how do I really explore this? Uh, how do I know if my target is being ubiquitinated? Or I ran a Western blot and I see a degradation of my target of interest, but how do I know if that's the only target? And is it possible that I'm missing other targets that are being degraded as well? So today we have a panel of experts who are going to share their real life experiences with the design and characterization of degraded molecules. Um, this webinar is an opportunity to hear about some of the different methods that we in the degradation field are commonly using to explore the development um, and testing of different targeted protein degraders. At the end of the talk, we'll have a live Q&A session to dive into more technical detail and please use this as an opportunity to ask and receive everyday tips and tricks um, for best practices in performing a lot of these experiments. So our panel of experts today includes uh, Dr. Vesna Vedma, who did her PhD in cancer biology at the University of Stuttgart, Germany, and has been part of the Truly Group since 2019 as a cell biologist, currently working in the Truly Labs collaboration with BI um, at the University of Dundee in the UK. Uh, Dr. Brianna Zerfus, who did her PhD in chemical biology at Boston College and her postdoc in the Department of Medicinal Chemistry and Molecular Pharmacology at Purdue University. Brianna is now a scientist in the biochemistry group at the Dana-Farber um, Center for Protein Degradation. Dr. Shroya Roy Berman, uh, who obtained his PhD from Johns Hopkins University and is now a biomolecular engineering research fellow in Dr. Eric Fisher's lab at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. Uh, and finally, Dr. Kusao Sumara Singh, uh, who completed his PhD in the Department of Chemistry at Wayne State University. And he is now a postdoctoral fellow in Dr. Craig Cruz's lab at Yale University. And with that, I will welcome Dr. Dr. Brianna Zerfus to start us off with the first presentation. Uh, thanks, Catherine, for the great introduction. Um, as Catherine mentioned, I'm currently a scientist at the Dana-Farber Center for Protein Degradation in Boston um, in the biochemistry group. So what I'm going to be going through today are some of the assays that we use to look at binding, ternary complex formation, and um, engagement in live cells. So before I get to that, I just want to give everybody just a quick look at to where I stand in the field and, you know, the perspective that I have as far as um, targeted protein degradation. So within the Center of Protein Degradation, um, we were established in 2019 under the leadership of um, Nathaniel Gray and Eric Fisher here at Dana-Farber. 
Um, and we were set up as a way to advance their current targets, but also to in innovate and develop new platforms for targeted protein degradation. So here are just a few examples of some of our capabilities and really what I'll focus on are two of the ones that I work towards, including the biochemical assays, as well as some of these cell-based occupancy assays. So to get us started, um, for target binding, a really popular technique is fluorescence polarization. Uh, one of the reasons why this is popular within um, the TPD field is because it's not dependent on enzymatic activity. So we're looking strictly at binding and don't need to have um, an active protein or a, an active site inhibitor uh, to look at binding. So you'll start with a fluorescently tagged molecule, and this is going to be something that is already known to bind your protein of interest. When these two are then mixed together, you can equilibrate to allow for binding, and then you'll be exciting the samples with polarized light such that all of the light is moving within um, a parallel axis. If we look at the two extreme situations here where we have um, all of this bound, um, all of our probe bound, and then the opposite extreme of being um, all of it unbound, what happens with the polarized light in these two situations are quite opposite. So for the bound samples, you, main, um, you maintain polarization, and this is going to be based off of the size of the molecules. So when we're bound, the probe is tumbling less quickly through a solution and the light is therefore scattered less from the, its original axis. So we see a lot more of the light moving in the same parallel direction versus the perpendicular direction. In the unbound, um, so this will then keep our polarization maintained. In the unbound situation, the light is being more scattered and you see it going off in several uh, directions and the intensity of the parallel versus the perpendicular um, has now changed and become more even. So in this case, your polarization is lost. We can uh, define millipolarization based off of this equation here, um, where you're just measuring those two different directions. Um, this G factor is going to be dependent on your um, your fluorophores as well as uh, insurance specific. So in most cases you can ignore that, especially if you're doing a, a screen and not changing instruments. Um, but the other advantage of this is that you can use it to look at protein-protein interactions. Um, a good rule of thumb here is to have a 10 times difference in molecular weight in order to be able to detect the difference in levels of polarization. So in a typical assay setup, uh, you would be initially starting with a given concentration of your probe and doing a titration of uh, protein. So for these types of assays, you will need to keep in mind that it can sometimes require high um, quantities of protein. To pick your um, conditions, you would want a, a point where you have about 50% of the probe binding for the protein concentration. Using a probe concentration close to 10 to 50 nanomolar, um, depending on the type of probe, this concentration may vary. But once you have this, these conditions set, that will be what you use uh, moving forward. Otherwise, uh, changing either of those conditions may uh, vary the ability for you to compare across experiments. So the final readout is actually a competition-based assay where you will take these conditions and then do a dose response for your competitor compounds. In the case of a non-binder, your millipolarization will stay consistent as the probe still um, maintains binding affinity to your protein. But in the case of a um, competitive binder, you'll start to see this dose response, and that can be used to look at binding affinity of that competitor. So as the probe is displaced, you'll see that the polarization starts to decrease as um, the probe is then free in solution. A few other things that are worth considering when optimizing this assay is your binding affinity of the probe to your protein. Um, using the best binder is typically not the best um, case here as that makes it more difficult to displace in the first place. Also your choice of fluorophore and linker length um, is also going to be important here um, 
and these two tend to, uh, especially with the fluorophore, that's going to be dependent on your instrument capabilities. So you're going to need to use a fluorophore with the filter set that um, you have within your instrument. So typically you want to try multiple different compounds here um, in this initial validation step. Another popular type of assay is time resolved FRET for looking at ternary complex formation. So typically here, we're looking at our target protein of interest and most often you're also looking at an E3 ligase. In order to have FRET, you'll need to have complementary labels. Um, these are not necessarily dependent on, um, don't always have to be used with the donor on the target and acceptor on the E3 ligase. But most often you're going to use a lanthanide based system as your donor and then a fluorophore on your second protein, which will act as an acceptor. So after the addition of compounds, you would expect to see this ternary complex forming. Now that your donor and acceptor are close together, there can be a fret exchange occurring. Uh, one thing I do recommend for these types of assays is really um, taking advantage of all the information you can get from an initial setup. So uh, changing the amount of equilibration time that you have um, for the addition of compounds can give you more information, not just on potency, but also on binding kinetics. So ultimately the readout is going to occur after um, exciting with the uh, wavelength of light for your donor. And as that gets excited and emits light, it should fall within the um, excitation wavelengths of your acceptor. And you can then see an intensity for your donor and a separate intensity for the acceptor. So again, instrument wise is going to, um, your fret pair is gonna be dependent on what uh, filters you have available on your instrument of choice. Taking the ratio of acceptor to donor, you can get, then get what is known as the TR fret ratio, and that's what you will plot against um, concentration of compounds. Most often for these types of assays, you will use a lanthanide chelate um, because this has a large Stokes shift, and also it has the time resolved uh, capabilities. So um, typical assay setup would include the equal concentrations of the proteins and a dose response of your compound. So again, we see this increase in TR fret that occurs as your um, compounds compose together. And then if you increase the compound further, you will start to make um, monovalent species and your fret will then decrease. Um, just a couple of things here, again, um, linker length and placement of your labels, as well as your choice of fret pair um, using europium and terbium. So uh, just wanted to go through a couple of challenges. These are things that I've personally observed. Um, probably the major one is intrinsic fluorescence from compounds. Um, this is just the structure of pomalidomide and it's a common um, cerebron targeting uh, compounds that is used for protax. What you may not know is that this aminothalamate stru structure um, has fluorescent properties and can then directly interfere with both FP and TR fret readings. So some, some suggestions for overcoming this would be to just examine the absorbance properties of your compounds before testing them. Um, an advantage here for TR fret is that you can uh, run a counter screen in which you're excluding one of the proteins. And if you see this change in TR fret, you know it's coming from the molecule. Um, another challenge that can occur um, when using purified proteins is having the right construct and the right labeling sites. Um, so it may be important to try different protein constructs, especially if you're looking at a larger protein um, and looking at different labeling sites in order to get what is going to uh, give you the right distance for, uh, for FRET to occur. The final assay I wanna go through um, is cellular engagement assays. This um, follows a lot of the same concepts as the in vitro TR FRET except you'll be using now NanoBret, where you have a luciferase, in this case, NanoLuc, uh, which uh, then transfers energy to your fluorophore probe. Um, the advantage of NanoLuc here is that it's smaller and brighter, which makes uh, your reading, your readout uh, much more sensitive. So again, we'll perform a competition assay and displacement of your fluorescent probe will decrease the NanoBret signal. 
Um, in order to set up these types of assays, what you'll need is your target protein of interest labeled with nanoluc. Um, this can be done either transient, transiently or through stable expression. Uh, just a quick note, this is not limited to kinases as this uh, figure may suggest. Um, so keep that in mind that you, you can really use any variety of protein that you want. Um, you'll also need a fluorescently labeled probe, um, something that will fall in the excitation range of 460 nanometers. And you'll also need the substrate for nanoloop, which is going to um, be what's emitting the luminescence in the first place. Uh, one of my favorite things about this assay is that it is cell-based, so it um, is very important for protax to get at um, differences in cell permeability. So just um, in the same way as with the other assays, you'll want to do a titration with the probe, pick that 50% um, occupancy so that it's easy, easily displaced, and then do a dose with your competitor. So similarly, your nanobret will stay the same when you have a non-binding molecule, and then when you um, have a uh, well-behaved binder, you will see um, this dose response. So um, again, run a competition and you're looking for a decrease in nanobret. And as I mentioned, since most of the um, concepts follow the same as TR fret, a lot of the challenges also follow the same. So you'll need to try multiple constructs of your protein and design different probes, trying out different fluorophores. And intrinsic fluorescence of your compounds will also uh, cause some issues here as well. So um, always running that counter screen, excluding your fluorescent probe can uh, keep you from going down the wrong path as far as a compound comes. So that just would like to thank you for your attention and I'll hand off to Vesna for our, um, our next talk. Uh, thank you, Brenna. And thanks, Catherine, for the kind introduction. Um, so as Catherine said, I am a cell biologist working at the Center for Targeted Protein Degradation at University of Dundee in Scotland. Uh, here at the center, we have uh, multidisciplinary teams uh, working on academic and translational projects in protag drug, drug discovery. Uh, our teams consist of chemists, structural biologists, biophysicists, and cell biologists. And together we are trying to um, advance the field of targeted protein degradation. So for myself as a cell biologist, my main role here is to first to screen compounds for degradation and nominate the best compounds uh, into like further uh, development. Uh, I'm also establishing essays that help understand underlying mechanisms of degraders. And together with chemists and biophysicists, I'm um, trying to move projects forward. So I'm sure you're all aware of the cascade that PROTAC has to go through in order to degrade a target. And today I'm gonna to focus on one aspect of this cascade, which I, and I will be talking about uh, targeted degradation itself. So um, the first thing we do when we get a fresh batch of new compounds is we test those compounds for degradation. Um, understanding degradation can really help move projects forward. And nowadays we have a plethora of techniques that can help us ans answer different questions. So um, I will start with um, mentioning uh, different cell lines. So this is very project specific and you should always be focusing on several different cell lines that, um, that are suitable for your project. Then uh, when we come to perform degradation experiment, we need to think of a time point at which we're gonna do that. So sometimes we have fast degraders, sometimes we have slow degraders, and it's not the same if we measure degradation at four hours and 24 hours or 24 hours, we can sometimes miss out on things. Uh, then of course, we need to be mindful of the concentration we're gonna use to treat the cells and measure degradation. If we go too high, we may be in the hook effect uh, field. And if we go too low, we may not see the effect. So when we have these things uh, measured, then we can rank the compounds. So is A better than B, better than C? And we do this based on the DC50 and the Dmax. Uh, degradation assays can also help us uh, establish the specificity of the compound. So uh, we can determine on-target effects or off-target effects. 
then we can also uh, examine whether uh, the, the degradation we're seeing is really dependent on the E3 ligase and the proteasome. So we can um, do different uh, co-treatment and competition assays. So for all these things that I've said, that I've mentioned, uh, there are a variety of techniques we can use. And in this talk, I'm gonna be uh, presenting a few of the uh, techniques that I'm personally using, and they can be uh, split into low throughput and high throughput techniques, but they can also be split into endpoint assays and kinetic assays. So to start with uh, the endpoint degradation, so the first, thing that we always do is a classical Western blot. Um, during the years, the last few years, there has been a development of automated Western blot devices. So here I have kind of um, summarized the, the similarities and differences between these two different techniques. So first of all, they're both antibody based. And when you start a project uh, and you want to do a Western blot or an automated Western blot, you need to first find if, if there is a specific antibody for your target on the market. Uh, and if there is, you need to buy it and you need to validate that antibody. So you need to make sure that the antibody is specific for your target. Now, um, so classical Western blot is quite low throughput. It requires a few days to get the final result. Um, so we normally reprobe for uh, our targets and loading controls. Uh, we don't uh, strip the Western, so it takes a few days to get the final result. Whereas uh, with automated Western blot, you get your result in a few hours. Uh, both of these te techniques uh, have the advantage that they do, they, you do endogenous detection of your target. So there are no tags required or anything else like that. Um, classical Western blot is easy to do, it's easy to optimize, whether automated Western blot requires really heavy optimization. And also classical Western blot can be made uh, very cheap or cheap-ish, uh, depending how, uh, how you, uh, whether your gels are lab made or they're precast, are you doing like slow transfer or like those very fancy six minutes transfers, whereas uh, automated Western blots are actually quite expensive and they do require quite a heavy optimization. Um, so these two techniques are quite low to mid throughput. Uh, when it comes to higher throughput techniques, uh, we like to use plate-based assays. So for this, for these kinds of assays, so Brianna has already mentioned uh, uh, nanoluc uh, luciferase, nanoluciferase. So for these assays, we, use the split luciferase technology. So nanoluc can be split into two parts. One of them is a high bit, which is 11 amino acid, uh, smaller part, and then the, the larger part called large bit. These two parts of the luciferase have quite high affinity. So when, whenever they are in proximity, they're gonna form the nanoluc luciferase uh, as a whole. So this high bit tag can be attached to the proteins uh, and that can be done either endogenously uh, by CRISPR approach, or you can overexpress it and or make a stable cell line. Um, and having this uh, hybrid tag on our proteins can enable us to screen uh, a larger number of compounds in a 96 well plate, for example, or a, or a 384 well plate. Um, other techniques, plate-based assays that are a bit higher throughput are ELISA-based and imaging-based. Um, so one uh, other technique that uh, relies quite a lot on the hybrid tag uh, is the kinetic degradation. So it is more low throughput, uh, but it gives you uh, quite a lot of information. So if we have our tag uh, on the protein endogenously, for example, or overexpressed, uh, both, uh, both views are valid, uh, but they do give you a different information and you have to be mindful of that. So uh, by doing this technique, you can uh, do measurements uh, every few minutes through a very long time period. And the parameters you get from this kind of uh, experiment are really valuable. So you can measure the, the, the degradation rate, the degradation maximum, the recovery rate, the time your compound stays at the maximal degradation. Uh, so you can see it uh, in this example here. 
So you can also see in this example how degradation at four hours differs from the degradation at, at 24 hours. So for example, if we measured the degradation at 24 hours initially with this compound, we wouldn't have caught this early, more potent degradation. So you have to be mindful of the time points, but you also have to know uh, the biology of your target. How does your target behave? So um, now, uh, if you have a compound that you want to move forward, uh, it is advisable to do an unbiased whole cell proteomics experiment to see how does your uh, compound affect other proteins in the cell. Of course, you can always uh, perform Western blot to, uh, to probe uh, several different targets, but uh, proteomics experiment really gives you um, the big picture. So uh, in proteomics, you can detect between five to 7,000 proteins um, in one experiment. And this experiment can tell you how specific your compound is. Uh, there are some uh, considerations you have to keep in mind for this kind of experiment. So that is that uh, the treatments have to be done under eight hours. Otherwise, you start seeing a mixture of different responses to your compound. Uh, the, you do require a negative control. Uh, so, for example, we make cis hydroxyproline VHL controls. So, for example, uh, compounds that have this hydroxyproline VHL binder can't bind the e trilagase, so therefore we don't see degradation. Um, there has to be a significant window of degradation between your active protac and your inactive protac. And uh, my advice is before you embark on proteomics experiment, uh, always check for degradation, always. Uh, and this is my final slide. So uh, I'd like to say just a few words about the Degron te technology. So Degron tags are used uh, when, for example, you want to orthogonally validate your target. Uh, if, for example, you don't have compounds yet for your target, or if you want to see whether your target is worth degrading, what would be the effect? So there is quite a lot of these uh, Degron tags on the market and these systems that you can use to check for that. So the most popular ones are, I guess, uh, DTAG, uh, an AID degradation system, and we have uh, loads more uh, Degron tag, tag technologies being developed. Uh, so we have this pump and hold bromo domain based tag by um, Dana Farber Cancer Institute and the bromo tag by CTPD in Dundee. And uh, I would like to thank you for your attention, and I'd like to um, uh, hand over to the next speaker, Shorya. Thank you, Vesna. Uh Today, I'll talk to you about some computational tools for product modeling and a new tool that we've developed for uh, predicting how degradable a certain protein is. So before I jump into the tools, uh, let's talk a little bit about how we think about complexes formed by these molecular clues. So conventionally, we think of two molecular clues. A monovalent molecular glue is something like what's shown here, where the compound sticks to one of the proteins and that modifies its surface and it helps it recruit a non-endogenous uh, target. For example, uh, in the E3 ligase uh, substrate receptor DK15, E7820 binds and it changes the surface so that this new substrate Erbium39 can be recruited, ubiquitinated, and degraded. A second class of degraders are the bivalent degraders, such as Protax, which is the topic of today's discussion. And we usually visualize them as having two parental compounds, which are uh, which are in which bind their respective proteins, and they're linked together by a certain linker. But this sort of a representation gives the idea that the E3 uh, substrate receptor and the target are not in contact with each other, and they don't have defined ways in which they uh, bind each other. Luckily, over the last three, four years, we've uh, been lucky to have uh, a bunch of um, a bunch of structures of E3s with their targets. And what you can observe in each of these cases is that there are extensive interactions between the target and the E3 ligase in all three cases. So perhaps we should uh, modify a picture of a protac from this to this. 
such that the product acts very similar to the monovalent molecular glue. And there is an interface, a rather extensive interface, between the E3 substrate receptor and the target. And this picture is what allows us to use computational tools because we can uh, now go on to predict what the ternary complex looks like. And from there, we can derive uh, structure activity relationships. But before we go any further, uh, we need to address the fact that what's been observed is that different products with the same set of proteins, so it's cerebron as your E3 ligase here and BRD4, BD1 as the target, gives completely different structures depending on which product you use. And what differs in these products is the linkers and where the linkers are placed. So when uh, designing a product, this becomes an essential uh, thing that we need to uh, look for. We need to look at linker length, rigidity, and that ultimately affects not only how these uh, proteins bind the E3 ligase, but also the biological activity and other properties like cell permeability. So it's reasonable to assume that if uh, through some sort of a computational tool, we are able to assess that there are certain preferred binding modes, and these are the binding modes that are preferred, uh, we should be able to figure out what kind of linkers fit best in this case. Unfortunately, we can't really use a, a very new tool like AlphaFold Multimer or other machine learning based tools because these are not evolved interfaces. But we have some older structural modeling tools which work very well in this case. So uh, here I'm showing you an attempt by a company called as uh, Chemical Computing Group where they tried out four different ways in which they try to model the protoc induced ternary complex. So the, the two big tasks in this case are protein-protein docking to determine what the overall complex looks like, and then linker sampling within that. So in one case, they tried to uh, sample the linker of the protoc and then place the proteins. That didn't quite work out. Then in another uh, method, they tried to cut off half the protoc and model uh, and then uh, sample the linker just by itself and then put one the, the other binding partner in place. That also wasn't as accurate. What they found to be the most accurate tool was this, where they first docked the E3 ligase to the target with both parental compounds in place. Then they sampled uh, the protoc with the linker independent of the context of the protein. And finally, they matched these docked E3 uh, target complexes to the product confirmations, and they were able to arrive at these complexes. Well, this was the most accurate of the methods tested. There were still a few drawbacks. That is, there were steric clashes between the linker and the protein because the linker was sampled without the context of the protein. And also, there was an improper, improper overlap between uh, the parental compounds and the protein. More recently, uh, the met some methods have uh, adapted this approach and refined it. And right now, uh, what we see working the best is that we do local protein-protein docking. And when I say that, I mean we start off uh, with a, confirm a case where the protein, uh, the target, and the E3 ligase are close to each other with their respective compounds facing each other. And we sample locally. A very We just sample this region around around the E3 ligase and the uh, target. And the tool of choice, uh, at least for us, is Rosetta Doc. Uh, but I must give a disclaimer that I wrote the most recent version of Rosetta Doc, so there might be a bit of a bias in that case. But what we have observed is that after doing these docking and clustering these complexes, we can assess them using other independent tools, like this one called Uru MQA, which, uh, which we can think of as a black box for most purposes, but it, uh, deals with Voronoi tessellations and how they overlap. Another alternative approach is to do short molecular dynamic simulations and look at the residence times of each of these different modes that you observe from docking. And the one that has the longest residence time is probably the one that is most likely. Using these methods, there have been two published methods called PRZRC and PROTAC model, both of which I've highlighted here. What they do is they first do local docking as I've described, and then they use RDK to model in the linker. But if you don't know what the linker is, then D-linker is one more uh, recently published method, which uses an ML-based algorithm to uh, construct the linker itself. Now, both of these methods have uh, achieved pretty high accuracies on the handful of structures that we have uh, 
the complexes that we have experimental structures for. So uh, let's assume using one of these methods, we can uh, form a ternary complex, which does resemble what's there inside the cell very well. Does that guarantee product activity? The answer turns out to be no. So here's a, uh, a paper by our moderator, Catherine, and her colleagues in the Fisher and uh, Gray labs. And what they did was they took 91 different compounds and they tested these uh, kinase degraders against all kinases in our uh, in, in the human uh, proteome. And what they observed was that some kinases degrade very easily, whereas others don't at all. And one might assume that this is because uh, they don't the the protox don't form the ternary complex, but they could experimentally observe complex in many cases, but no degradation. So we just got us thinking, how is that possible? How is that the formation of a stable ternary complex is not sufficient for degradation? Our colleagues in Shirley Lewis lab at Dana Fargo, they took these kinase degradability data and they uh, looked for associations across these large publicly available data sets. And the two associations that came out most, uh, uh, that had the best associations, the two, the, the two features that had the best associations were ubiquitination potential. That is the fraction of ubiquitin, uh, ubiquitinated sites of the total lysines. And these ubiquitination sites are lysines where there has been experimental evidence that uh, they were ubiquitinated in the cell at some point. And this is done through mass spec. And they found that that had the best positive correlation and the half-life had the best negative correlation. Based on this, uh, they've come up with this model called as MAPD. And I'm giving you the website here where you can check it out. Uh, so it turns out that the degradability of a particular protein is partially intrinsic to the protein itself. And you can, if you have a bunch of targets, which you want to design degraders against, perhaps, uh, if you run them through this program, you can help you uh, prioritize your targets as what is more likely to be amenable to degradation. Also, there is no requirement of a target structure. The limitation, however, is that because it's dependent on external databases, there are many cases where some data is missing. So you do see artificially low MAPD scores, which does not necessarily mean that the target is intractable. An example being BRD4, which we all know uh, degrades very well. So we took this data and we thought, uh, what does that mean in terms of the structure? So here I'm showing uh, the Cullen 4 uh, complex. And this is the part that we talked about before, the substrate receptor and the target. But when you put it in complex, you see that it's uh, in this sort of banana shaped molecule, the E2 is at this end. And so it's reasonable to assume that if there are, let's say four lysines on the surface of this target, these two lysines in red, they will not be accessible by the E2. So we can't really pinpoint where the E2 is because uh, Cullen is a fairly flexible uh, uh, protein, but we can say that it won't reach this far, but these two uh, lysines are within its reach. However, not all lysines are ubiquitinatable. There could be a variety of reasons why a certain lysine uh, just cannot accept a ubiquitin, although it is at the surface. So based on some uh, E3 target docking, we were able to look at all these, uh, about 200 kinases, which had structures. And what we saw was when we divided the ubiquitination sites by E2 accessibility, we could very easily distinguish uh, in many cases uh, which kinases had high degradability and which ones had low degradability. And this is, if you were to randomly arrange uh, the ubiquitination sites around, that would not be the case. And a similar idea was uh, recently used uh, and developed completely independently by a lab at the University of Florida. And they used this to design uh, degraders against BCL2 and BCLXL. What they did was they docked using this P Rosetta C method that we had described before. They docked uh, BCL2 uh, and BCL XL to VHL, and they figured out that there's a narrow ubiquitination band in which the E2 can deliver these lysines. And they used uh, that to predict uh, which lysines are. are within the range. And also then they rationalized looking at the structure, which lysines are possible, possibly available for ubiquitination. Based on that, they only had one or two lysines in each case. And the mutation analysis revealed how the ubiquitination mechanisms proceed uh, by this product. So 
so i think uh, the message uh, from here is that that we can use these docking programs and ubiquitination site uh, code to not only figure out what are the best products that will work uh, in our case but also which positions can li will likely be ubiquitinated and hence give us an idea of what the ubiquitination mechanism is with that i'd like to thank uh, my uh, friends in the Fisher Lab and the Liu Lab, our funding sources, uh, our organizers, and thank you all for your attention. And now I'll pass it on to Kusil. All right. Welcome everyone to the last part of the webinar. So during the next 10 minutes, I will uh, walk you through how to design traffic tags to induce uh, the degradation of transcription factors. <clears throat> So since transcription factors recognize and binds to specific DNA sequences, uh, one can hijack their DNA binding ability uh, to selectively recruit and direct them to a proteolytic pathway for it, uh, degradation. Uh, to do that, uh, you can simply find the consensus sequence, uh, DNA sequence uh, for the bifunctional molecule design uh, to recruit transcription factor of interest and E3 ligase. Uh, so we can do this in uh, <clears throat> in different ways, uh, but today I'm going to focus only on uh, uh, the first generation traf tags uh, that we developed uh, using a chimeric uh, CRISPR RNA and double stranded DNA as a chemical biology tool. So uh, what we call a traf tag is uh, the chimeric CRISPR RNA and double stranded DNA. So in this traf tag uh, design, uh, the space sequence uh, of the guide RNA. Uh, is replaced uh, with the double-stranded uh, DNA that is uh, specific to a transcription factor of interest. So next, uh, uh, the transcription of traf uh, into cells uh, that express DCAS9 herotax 7 will recruit transcription factor of interest uh, into the, the proximity of uh, VHLE 3 ligase in the presence of a heloprotac. So in the current system, uh, we are using a DCAS9 herotax 7 as the E3 recruiting handle. Uh, therefore, we need to make sure that uh, Herotax 7 uh, fused uh, DCAS9 is not getting degraded by the Heloprotac. So one way to address this issue is by uh, fusing uh, uh, <coughs> you know, Herotax 7 at NOC terminus of DCAS9 and evaluate its uh, degradation by addition of a Heloprotac. So we can also fine tune the, the orientation of the uh, and the proximity of recruited VHL by uh, exploring different link attachment sites, uh, different linker length and composition uh, within the Helopro tag. So as an alternative strategy, uh, other low molecular weight, uh, but ligandable uh, proteins such as FKBP uh, can also be used in the place of Helotac 7. And we should remember that again, we have to perform, you know, optimization in terms of, uh, you know, <clears throat> the degradation of the DCAS9 herotax 7. We want to avoid the degradation of uh, DCAS9 herotax 7. Uh, so once we come up uh, with an undegradable DCAS9 herotax 7 protein, or at least a system uh, that is less susceptible for uh, degradation by heloprotax, so we next uh, pick a transcription factor and custom synthesize. Uh, the traf tag to target it. <clears throat> so what I really want to highlight here uh, is that uh, how to select uh, and predict uh, uh, the predict uh, whether the, the traf tag and DCAS9 herotax 7 combinations are going to do uh, their intended job or not. So uh, depending on the, the position of the herotax 7 on DCAS9 herotax 7 protein and the traf tag, so you are using, uh, so which means, uh, so whether the double stranded DNA portion is at three prime end or the five prime end uh, can dramatically affect the degradability of your target protein. So if you look at the, the first crystal structure, uh, which shows on uh, how guide RNA, <coughs> excuse me, how guide RNA uh, position uh, when uh, it's uh, bound to uh, Cas9 protein. So as you can see, both N-terminus and C-terminus of uh, DCAS9 are facing as the same side as the three prime end of the guide RNA. So this suggests a high probability of getting E3 ligase and transcription factor uh, to the, the same side of the, uh, the protein complex if you append double-stranded DNA at the three prime end of the CRISPR RNA. However, so if you look at the, uh, the other side of the, the structure, so you'll see that the five prime end of the guide RNA is facing the opposite side of the C terminus, 
uh, but the same side as the interminus of de Kastein protein. Therefore, you still have the chance to explore different combinations of C uh, terminus or interminus de Cas9 with uh, three prime or five prime traf tag, depending on uh, different transcription factors uh, you are targeting. So when you design traf tags, uh, so you have only two options. Uh, either you have you can attach double stranded DNA at the five prime end uh, or the three prime end of the the CRISPR RNA, as we discussed uh, in the the last slide. <clears throat> However, so there are many uh, ways to optimize traf tag. Uh, to find a better uh, composition that can be used to successfully uh, degrade uh, your transcription factor of interest. Uh, when we design double strand DNA sequence, uh, so we should consider adding a few extra bases at both, uh, <coughs> you know, at, uh, at both sides of the, the transcription factor binding site. So this allows uh, transcription factor to fully recognize its consensus binding um, of conformation. Uh, as it recognizes it with uh, the genomic DNA. Also, it allows uh, less strain um, and, uh, you know, more flexibility uh, to the, the TRAF tag. So including uh, three or several extra bases uh, will be helpful in that way. So adding extra copies of uh, consensus DNA sequence uh, so will further facilitate uh, the interaction uh, or recruitment of transcription factor as we uh, usually see uh, in, you know, report of last week as well. So in addition, uh, you can also uh, play around uh, with the spacer DNA sequence, uh, which is uh, positioned in between the, the double-stranded DNA uh, and the CRISPR RNA. So this uh, gives more flexibility and more room to optimize the, the distance or the, the precision proximity uh, to physically interact uh, the transcription factor uh, with the recruited E3 ligase. So you change uh, three bases at a time or in, in the later stage of craft tag uh, evaluation. Uh, so you can fine tune the degradation by changing even a single base at a time. So if you are worried about the, the stability uh, of your traf tag, so you can also synthesize them with uh, phosphorothioate bonds, which are you know, uh, resistant uh, towards nuclear, uh, nucleus attack. So, but usually uh, you might not want to, uh, you know, do that because uh, one staff tag is, um, you know, complex with a decast line heterotax seven within the cell. Um, so it is uh, pretty stable and, uh, uh, you know, pretty stable um, towards uh, uh, new places. So in addition to exploring uh, different uh, composition of craft tags, you might also want to consider uh, using a control traf tag in your experiments. Simply uh, choose a scramble sequence uh, of the uh, DNA portion and you can uh, link that uh, to the CRISPR RNA to get the control traf tag. So this should not um, uh, bind uh, to the transcription factor and theoretically the degradation should be spared. Uh, next uh, important step uh, I wanted to highlight uh, is that the transfection of traf tag and more importantly, uh, the order of addition. So you will use RNAi max uh, as the transfecting reagent. And in general, uh, you can follow the manufacturer recommended protocol for the transfection step. However, the most uh, critical factor, as I mentioned, is that uh, <clears throat> the introduction of traf tag uh, prior to the, the halo protect treatment. So even though uh, you use uh, DKS9 halo tag 7, uh, that is less susceptible for degradation, uh, by halo protect. So if you introduce uh, this halo protect prior to the traf tag, sometimes it can negatively affect the stability of the DCAS9. So in addition, uh, if the E3 like ligase is complex, uh, uh, complex is uh, preformed uh, before uh, we introduce traf tag to the system, it can sterically affect the, uh, you know, uh, the binding of the guide RNA as well as the recruitment of transcription factor uh, to the degradation uh, complex. Uh, therefore, a transfection of traf tag uh, prior to uh, halo protect treatment is a, a critical step uh, to keep in mind. Uh, finally, uh, you can consider including an epimer control to control uh, to confirm uh, the A3 ligase uh, recruitment, um, and uh, we can use a uh, scrambled uh, traf tag uh, to confirm uh, transcription factor recruitment. So, in addition to this, uh, so we can also uh, design uh, all scramble. Uh, traf tag uh, that is incapable of binding to both a DCAS9 and the transcription factor. So uh, this will uh, provide additional uh, confirmation of DCAS9 involvement in the process. Um, 
All right. So I think um, so. I could uh, share key aspects of craft tech design uh, during the time I have, and I hope uh, this will uh, be helpful to folks uh, who are interested in applying craft tags in their transcription factor related uh, biological experiments. So uh, to quickly summarize uh, that we um, uh, what we talked today, uh, so we can uh, include a single or multiple copies of consensus. Uh, transcription factor binding sequence uh, within the double strand DNA portion of the TRAF tag. Uh, addition of extra flanking um, bases at both end of double stranded DNA may uh, provide higher probability of successful transcription factor binding. Uh, so we have the chance to optimize the spacer DNA sequence uh, within the TRAF tag, as well as uh, the linker composition of helical tags. And most importantly, so we can readily use this approach to target many uh, transcription factors uh, with non-DNA binding sequences, so which are readily available via many online uh, resources. Uh, with that, I want to thank everyone for uh, attending the webinar, and uh, I will hand over uh, back to Catherine to continue with questions. Thank you, Kusal, and thank you to all of today's panelists. We will now be starting our Q&A section of the webinar. Uh, please type in any questions in the Ask a Question box in the upper corner of your screen. Also, please note that the webinar organization team have put together a resources section, and this can be found in the upper right of your window. So now let's jump into some of these questions that we have. Uh, so the first question I have is for Shoya. Uh, how often is the linker length prediction successful, and do you see many cases where it is just completely wrong? So uh, most of the methods that have been tested have been on modeling already existing products and rationalizing why something worked and something didn't. I'm not aware of any publicly available method to predict linker lips from scratch, which has been extensively tested, which really is the holy grail of product design. So to answer your question, we really don't have a good answer. Awesome. Uh, as a general question for everyone, what criteria do you typically use to prioritize which targets to pursue or which degraded molecules to develop? Brianna? So as far as targets go, I guess it depends on what the overall goal is and like disease relevance for those targets um, and how that kind of fits into our overall portfolio uh, and our overall expertise as far as um, the center goes. Um, so, so sometimes we'll prioritize if we see that there's a greater therapeutic need over other potential targets. It's also about like our, um, our set of compounds and uh, how much SAR we can build into that. Is there any information in terms of, I guess, uh, ligase scaffolds or target scaffolds that you would use to kind of help you prioritize what molecules you would use to design your structures or your compounds? Um, we do use modeling at times, so um, having a more attractive model uh, would also help us prioritize in that case. If it looks like the binding model is more favorable, then we'll use those types of tools in order to prioritize as well. Awesome. Uh, let's go to a question for Vesna and Brianna and possibly Shroya and Kusel as well. Uh, do you usually run the whole suite of assays on all new targets and compound series, or what are your feelings on the best standard workflow for screening molecules for new targets? I know you all have targets you're working on, but do you have a favorite workflow that you would go to for a new target? Um, I can take that question first. Uh, so typically, uh, it depends on the where the target came from, whether um, which assays it's going to go through. Through. So if we do a biochemical high throughput screen, um, then typically we would go through the biochemical assays first ahead of doing degradation assays. Uh, and then I would say the next assay that we would prioritize is a Western blot since that doesn't really require any genetic modification and it can also be done in several different cell lines um, without having uh, to do anything new to the cell line, just treating with our compound, as long as there's a reliable antibody. Awesome. What are the feelings from the other panelists? Do you think along the same lines or any additions there? Uh, yeah, I would uh, agree with Brianna's workflow. <laughs> awesome. Uh, this question is for Shroya. Is Proceda the a program which can keep targets private to preserve IP, or is that data you collect on your program? Let's see, so this is not a program by us, but 
on their website i think you might have an option to keep the uh, targets private but you can always uh, download it and run it locally so that might be a good option if you want to keep your targets private awesome and this is a question for everyone um, what are some important considerations when selecting cell lines for your experiments and if you're looking at cerebellum based degraders or vhl based degraders do you often look at the expression levels of your ligases in those cell lines first or how do you go about deciding what cell lines to use uh, yeah so in terms of the you know the expression of the e3 ligases uh, depending on the cell line you are using uh, from my experience i think it is not a you know good um, uh, idea to just look uh, for the expression levels of your E3 ligase. Uh, sometimes you won't see. It, it actually depends on uh, what uh, type of um, you know assay you are using to uh, look for the expression of uh, whatever the E3 ligase. Sometimes even though you cannot detect the E3 ligase by Western blotting, that's the most common way of people doing it. And uh, still, uh, you know, so there might be undetectable level of E3 ligase and it might be enough to induce degradation if you introduce uh, you know active protect into the system so i think uh, so in the in the first place it's it's not a good idea it's okay to screen but even though you're not seeing that e3 ligase uh, within that cell line uh, or panel of cell lines you are planning to use you can always go ahead and you know uh, test protex um, in the cell line, sometimes you know, depending on the sensitivity and the the, the potency of your protect, you might still see the the degradation unless it is you know fully. If, if it is not like expressing um, at all, so you won't see the degradation. But uh, I think it is not a good idea to based on the just the expression level by you know Western blotting something like that. Yeah, you should definitely test for the expression level of your target in in the cell line you want to use. That's something you should do in the beginning, and I think also that having a, a panel of different cell lines will kind of help you to get a clear picture. If you if you limit your experiments only to one cell line, you might have what we call like a cell line specific effect. So it's always good to have a few different cell lines in your panel that you work with, and those cells should be, for example, if you work in cancer, they're going to be cancer cells, and if you work in lung cancer then they're going to be derived from lung cancer. They're going to harbor different mutations or harbor different isoforms or the protein uh, you're looking at and so on. So in terms of cell line specific effects, how, lo how often do you see things like that? Are there specific cell lines that um, might not be as good to look at with degraders? Like I know the ALK paper from the Gray Lab shows that there's higher expression of ABC transporters, which pump out the molecules, but... Mm -hmm. Are these things that you all commonly think about when when do, planning your experiments? Uh, to be honest, I, I don't think I've encountered anything in, along those lines in the past few years. Uh, I'm just aware that they do exist. Like you said, the high level of transporters and so on. Uh, but to be fair, we just use like a really large panel of cell lines to kind of avoid this to start with. Mm -hmm. I would just to add on to that, I would say we have a few cell lines that we kind of use throughout and then we wouldn't get to uh, specific cell lines too, too much until we have something more as a validated degrader. Um, and once we know we want to make a, a bigger investment into a specific target, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. We will go back to Brianna. Um, have you found that the linker link for FRET protein labels varies a lot for different targets, or do you have a go-to linker link that works in most cases for most targets that you're looking at? Okay, great. So um, I would say that just based off of synthetic ease, we do have a, a small number of linkers that we use so that we can obviously apply these across several different compounds. Um, typically, I'd say it's between 8 and 12 atoms between the fluorophore and your um, your binding molecule. But uh, yeah, you want to keep you want to keep that somewhat flexible, and um, you also want to try to avoid a short distance so that your fluorophore isn't having um, interfering binding with your protein target as well. Okay, great. Uh, we have a question from for Kusal. 
a question of redundancy and specificity of occupancy by transcription factors. Is it possible that target sequence binds other transcription factors in addition to one that you may be trying to target? And if so, is it less specific um, than one would wish? Yeah, so it, it depends on uh, what transcription factor you're trying to target. Uh, I agree with, uh, with the comment. Uh, some transcription factors, you know, uh, within the same family of transcription factors, so they tend to, uh, you know, recognize and bind to a similar, uh, you know, consensus sequence. Uh, but mm, so if you want to go after, you know, one specific uh, subclass of transcription factor, you can always optimize the uh, the, the sequence uh, to get a, some, you know, kind of uh, specificity. Uh, so you can always play around with the, the flanking sequence uh, to, you know, get rid of other target protein and find, uh, you know, optimized sequence that is specific for your transcription factor. So it's a little bit laborious in that way. But uh, most of the, the target, you know, transcription factors, uh, more specifically, you know, the disease are relevant transcription. Factor. That's what we are interested in. Uh, we want to get rid of, you know, these uh, troublesome uh, proteins or trans transcription factors. So most of which I think uh, are not really recognizing, uh, at least uh, according to my uh, knowledge, uh, they are not uh, binding to the same uh, the sequence. So in that way, we have the, the opportunity uh, of targeting uh, with uh, transcription factors by tra traf tags. So the, the limitation is there. So always, you know, if we talk about like pro tags uh, or molecular glues, so it has, you know, uh, its own limitations. Uh, I think it's it's true for traf tags as well. Fantastic. So we have a nice practical question here for everyone. Uh, what time course do you initially use to test for degradation via Western blotting? Uh, 24 hours or 48 hours, and then do you go back to four or six, or where do you start um, with blots? I think I can start with that. Uh, so in general, uh, if you are, when, you're, when you're testing a protac, you know, so if you know your protac is uh, really working, so you can always do a time course, you know, uh, at least uh, covering uh, one hour to 24 hours. So if you start testing your protac with a long hour, probably 24 or 48 hours, sometimes depending on the turnover and the stability of your protac, uh, and depending on the cell line as well. Uh, so you might not see the degradation of your target protein, even though it degrades as a, you know, like early time points, because uh, so if your protein is not protac is not stable enough uh, to you know uh, have a persistent degradation and your target protein have a you know higher turning uh, uh, you know turn off rate so uh, you will not you know capture your degradation but I think uh, so the best way to uh, start with is at least doing three uh, times uh, maybe uh, three hour twelve hour twenty four hours in that way you can track um, you know at what time point uh, you are. Uh, you know, you see the degradation. Are there any differences of opinion here? I feel like this is the sort of question where we all do it differently. Um, I would say it, it depends on where the target comes from. Like we, we do find new targets using proteomics. So we would typically validate that through um, a similar time course as that experiment was done in. Um, other than that, I would say 24 hours is a good start um, unless you're aware that your protein gets resynthesize really, really quickly. Yeah, I would also start at 24, maybe with a wider titration range, and then go back to four if there is like a, a hint that you should do that. Perfect. So what are some of the common mistakes that people make when running degraded experiments? What are some of the mistakes we have all made when running degraded experiments? Um, I would say personally not having a fully validated antibody can really cause some problems when you're starting off with Western blots. So putting in the investment to make sure that your antibody is high quality and that your uh, the protein you're labeling is um, on your Western blot is actually what you think it is it will definitely help you out in the long run. Um, and also probably not trying out multiple uh, mix and match for binders when you're when you're talking about protax. Um, you want a high level of diversity to begin with so that you don't miss anything by pigeonholing uh, your your compound structures. I can drop in some issues from proteomics point of view where not working on cells that are healthy or happy and thinking that you're degrading lots of targets, but really it's just your cells dying. Um, that's something I've seen a fair bit of over the last few years. Does anyone else have any 
common problems or issues they notice in their experiments that might be helpful for others? Uh, for large screens, I've noticed that uh, the results of the screen are very dependent on the degraded concentrations. So I had for the longest time for these very large screens been using a very high concentration. But then when I did a concentration assay, uh, like concentration titration for these uh, screens, the results are quite different. That's a good point. So I have a question here about SETSA assays. Has anyone thought about SETSA assays for Protax, or does anyone have an opinion here um, about SETSA as a method to explore Protax? Uh, I've done a few SETSA experiments. Uh, I can awesome. comment maybe. <laughs> so, so I did this uh, actually only a few times, and it was when we wanted to check if the binder will bind to our protein of interest. Um, so I quite liked it. So you can do it. I did it actually like two different ways. You can do a classical uh, Western blot after after heating your cells. So you can load the cell lysates and probe for your um, protein with antibodies. Or if you use hybrid tag, you can detect hybrid by adding large bits. So therefore, you can also make it a bit more high throughput. Um, I think both techniques are quite nice to to use, and I think SETSA will give you a yes or no answer, uh, like is there binding or, or is there no binding, which is a really good starting point some, sometimes. Uh, the only thing uh, I would say to someone is maybe check the literature before, like whether your protein of interest has been tried out in SETSA, because not all of the proteins can actually generate a shift in the melting curve. It depends on their size, uh, how do they look like. So if they are small and globular, like it's most likely that they won't do the, the shift when you do the, the melting. So that's my advice. Just have a look at the literature before you start with these experiments. Awesome. So I'm just going to round up on the final question. Uh, so what are the current gaps in Protect technology assays that you would like to see improved upon in the near future? So where do you think we need help? I think uh, so. We need uh, you know uh, a large uh, pool of accessible E three ligases. We all know like we have like you know, over five hundred E three ligases, uh, but not many E three ligases actually used in protect design. I think um, so. If we can improve uh, uh, you know the ligandable E three ligase, um, so that will you know um, increase uh, the potential of protac using in cell line dependent or tissue dependent or tumor specific uh, protacs so that is um, so one thing i think uh, we should uh, that, that one gap in the in the protac technology uh, and i think also um, since uh, protacs uh, are a little bit you know larger molecules uh, you know compared to conventional inhibitors uh, so if we can like play around with uh, the the linker composition and um, novel you know linkerology uh, that makes a shorter and uh, you know simple uh, connecting um, uh, link molecules uh, between the two wall heads and also i think uh, as i mentioned uh, uh, we need to find more tissue and uh, uh, tumor specific with ligases uh, so if we want to have you know more specific uh, uh, effect on uh, the disease models. So those are the, the things that I can't think of right now. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, we are out of time. Um, so I'm going to turn it back over to Tanuja for some closing comments. Thank you so much, Catherine, for your help moderating the webinar, fielding the questions. Um, and thank you, Brianna, Vesna, Gosal, and uh, Sharia. I think just having this input from you guys, I mean, your labs are some of the you know, the labs in the world that are driving the research in this rapidly evolving field. So having you come on and talk about your work, share your experiences, I think it's really very helpful. So really appreciate you doing that. And uh, just wanted to remind the audience that um, this webinar will be archived on the BioCompare website, which is biocompare.com. And a link to the archive version will be emailed to all of you, um, I think, within 24 hours. So you will have the ability to go back, view the archive, and also you know, feel free to pass it along to others who you think might benefit from listening to this, uh, you know, to the advice that all our panelists shared with us today. 
There are also resources on uh, the webinar platform that have been uh, shared by our sponsors. So a big thank you to our four sponsors, Nanotemper, BPS Bioscience, GA Instruments, and Biotechni for, of course, supporting this webinar, but also for sharing the resources that they think will help the community. So don't forget to check out those resources before you log out today. And uh, with that, I must thank all of you. I know we all have such busy lives, but thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. And we very much look forward to seeing you at one of our uh, future bio, uh, bio compare driven uh, bench tip webinars. So that's all I have. Thank you and goodbye.